Welcome to our panel discussion for today, Treaty Obligations and Accountabilities. And uh, this will be a, a three-person panel discussion involving uh, Lil Anderson, Ruben Berg and Trevor Marque, who you heard from uh, in a previous um, a day session of the conference, who was so good, we invited him back, and uh, uh, in lieu of one of our um, uh, one of our uh, panelists, who is unfortunately on sorry business today, and Lil Anderson was uh, unable to uh, join us uh, live, but I did get a chance to chat with her um, some uh, days ago uh, for this session. And we will start with her, Lil Anderson. She's the Chief Executive of the Office of Maori Crown Relations, uh, Te Ara Fite, and is originally from uh, the small community of Pangaru uh, in the Hokianga. And uh, Te Ara Fite is a departmental agency that reports to the Minister for Maori Crown Relations and uh, the Minister for Treaty of Waitangi Negotiations and the Minister responsible for the Marine and Coastal Area Act. And uh, Te Arawite was created to consolidate a range of distinct but related government functions that support the journey of Maori Crown partnerships and help the Crown build on the sense of renewal in Maori Crown relations established through the treaty settlement process. Lil has more than 25 years experience in the public service across a whole range of roles and recently was redeployed for six months to the New Zealand COVID-19 All of Government Operational Command Centre. And there she led a cross government program called Caring for Our Communities, aimed at supporting the most vulnerable groups uh, within communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, through COVID-19 and beyond into recovery. But we start our conversation by uh, by focusing on her work with the relatively new agency and uh, started by asking what exactly its, its role is. The first thing is to say we're a relatively new agency uh, and we're really responsible for uh, helping government and Māori partners navigate our way through uh, the Māori Crown relationship in its various forms. So we uh, negotiate all of the treaty settlements in New Zealand, as well as all of the customary rights and the foreshore and seabed, uh, as well as navigating through post-settlement and what partnership might look like uh, now and in the future. So uh, it's a big task. Uh, and we are enjoying uh, the work that we're doing in it. And um, and briefly, and mostly for our um, non-New Zealand participants, can you briefly describe the settlement process in in uh, New Zealand and the settlements that are being reached? I think uh, the treaty settlement process is almost 25 years old now. Uh, and we have concluded 89 settlements to date. Uh, they are with largely iwi-sized groupings around New Zealand, uh, negotiated directly with government, um, largely based on three key parts of the treaty settlement package, uh, being the cultural redress, the return of lands, uh, commercial redress, uh, an agreed financial redress amount and commercial rights. Uh, and a historical account, which is an agreed version of the history between that iwi and the Crown, as well as an apology. So uh, we only have three more treaty settlement mandates uh, that are yet to take place. So we are well through our treaty settlement process now uh, and looking to conclude settlements over the next three to five years. So there's three outstanding. Um, how how long are they taking, and what's the difference between those that have taken longer, perhaps some of or all of these three, and and other settlements? Each each settlement is very different from another, and so uh, while there are common features in terms of the you know the types of packages. Uh, each settlement has required something quite unique. Um, so we have seen treaty settlements take as short a time as 13 months. 
uh, from start to finish, and that is from a mandating process for that group through to legislation being passed and assets being returned uh, to another process which has taken almost 16 years so far. Uh, and is still going. And a lot of that is based on the complexity um, of the settlement. And really, because it relies on two partners agreeing, uh, we cannot do it by ourselves. And so uh, often, you know, we disagree on things uh, and we take a bit of a break from negotiations and hopefully recommence um, at, a, at a future date. And when all of the um, the settlements are, are finalised, and, and that doesn't sound like, in relative terms, too far away, what's then the next phase of the relationship between the, the Crown and, and EWI, and then what does that look like for the work that your agency does? That's a great question. I think... Um, the way we express it is the Māori Crown relationship with New Zealand is a journey and uh, what we've been doing for the last you know, 25 to 50 years has been the reset of the relationship, a broken relationship. Uh, our ability, I think, as the Crown to say sorry, uh, our ability to know what we're saying sorry for has been a really, in part of, really important part of rebuilding the relationship um, we're now at a stage where we can look to present and look to future. I think Professor McDonaldson called the process we've just been through something like truth-telling. Uh, it's an important phase of getting to partnership. So we're now at a point where we need to sustain the relationship, and part of that is about keeping our promises and making sure what we do what we said we would do. Uh, and we then look towards partnerships that are based on mutual trust, which we haven't had for a very long time, uh, mutual respect, uh, and I think, you know, mutual cooperation. Um, and those partnerships are really the ones that uh, take us into the future. Um, some of the partnerships we've had are more deficit-based, uh, about the fact that Māori are so high in statistics in our country. And what partnerships allow us to do is take a look at that together rather than one tri party trying to fix the other. So I think it offers real hope for where the relationship might go uh, and signals, I think, that the treaty relationship that was envisaged in 1840 might be possible again. You mentioned earlier that um, part of the settlements is um, an apology, an agreed version of the history, uh, financial um, and, and commercial uh, rights and, and compensation, as well as um, cultural redress in terms of giving back land to um, Maori groups. From your um, dealings with various groups, what what's the most important of all of those elements in resetting the relationship and coming closer to a genuine partnership? I think each group places an uh, an emphasis on different parts of the package, but I I think the most common feature then is the fact that the crown is acknowledging uh, that it broke trust. Uh, we make very specific acknowledgements about specific events. Uh, about certain events which lead to the loss of life uh, for Māori, and we acknowledge and say sorry for those things. Um, I think without that, a treaty settlement process and even partnership really isn't possible. Um, so I think that would be the common feature. And yes, each of them features a different variety of commercial redress, be it 170 million, which has been our largest settlement to date, um, or, you know, the return of highly cultural lands where villages were once based, and those are important. But I think without the acknowledgement of our past uh, and an apology for those things that the Crown did to dishonour that trust, uh, I don't think treaty settlements would be where they are today. So in the, in the Australian context, truth-telling, as it's described over here, is a relatively um, new concept. But how important is that truth-telling um, as part of treaty-making, would you say, and that ongoing partnership? 
Uh, I think it's fundamental, Dan. I don't think you get to true partnership uh, without it. And largely that's because, you know, you imagine, you know, if you are in a disagreement with someone, a very difficult one, and uh, you try to just ignore the fact that that happened and move to, right, let's work together on this really great thing. Um, I just think it's, uh, it's not in human nature to move to trust so quickly after a series of acts that have removed every trace of that trust. So um, I'm really strongly of the view that a process of truth telling uh, or treaty settlements or history telling as we say in New Zealand uh, is a really core cool component of good partnership. Otherwise, I think you're in a position as partners where you continually doubt each other's motives, where you're trying to grieve uh, for what was done and what was lost at the same time as people are asking you to move on. Um, and I think it just makes for a really difficult partnership. It feels uneven and unequal. Um, so we've found that without it, uh, partnerships don't really work here. And in terms of the financial compensation that you, uh, you've mentioned, what are some of the initiatives or programs or, or ways in which that money has been redirected, redirected by different groups? Uh, we've seen really phenomenal growth in terms of uh, the value of the what is called in New Zealand the Māori economy. Uh, while not all of that is from treaty settlements, you know, the growth of some iwi's bottom lines and baselines has been phenomenal and each iwi takes a different approach. Most look at investments over a longer period of time. The ability to provide uh, grants, to provide uh, the ability for scholarships for our young people uh, to attend university, come out of university with uh, degrees and the ability to move into work immediately uh, for their iwi uh, is, a, is an opportunity we haven't had for a very long time. Uh, I myself, you know, came out of home and left, left where I was from immediately to work in Wellington. Um, that's not really a future we want for Māori. We want our people to be able to work at home uh, for the good of their iwi. And so I think seeing that uh, generational wealth uh, is, has been a really important feature of treaty settlements to date. Some buy assets, uh, some invest in different businesses. Um, a number of iwi are co-investing together. Um, you know, they look at some of our bigger companies around New Zealand and uh, think about uh, joint ventures. Uh, and so the, the fact that they can now do that uh, was unheard of 40 years ago. Um, so it's been a fantastic, I think, period of growth and opportunity, but we're not quite there yet. I know this is um, possibly difficult to, to, to answer, given that treaty has been just so much a part of the New Zealand um, experience for you know, coming up to two centuries now. But do you think in terms of partnerships between the Crown and, and the government and First Peoples, that building those partners in within the prism of a treaty uh, is, is helpful or, or constraining? Um, we have found it helpful, I think, uh, and that's because we have the Treaty of Waitangi as a really important document in New Zealand. Um, that very document provides for the type of partnerships I think we all aim for. Uh, it has three articles and, you know, the first is about uh, lawmaking and the ability of the government to make those laws. The second is about Māori exercising rangatiratanga or um, dis decision making over their own affairs and authority. Um, and the third is really the equilibrium of those two things working together. Uh, so I, I feel like um, the treaty has played a really big part in why we've landed there. Uh, we've been able though to look at partnerships outside of the treaty space. So. Uh, we have a lot of Māori and corporations that um, manage large tracts of land. So we're able to form partnerships 
with them outside of a treaty context. So it's not impossible uh, to do that outside of a treaty, uh, but it is a really important part of New in New Zealand of the journey we've all been on. Thank you, Lil Anderson, for joining us for uh, that conversation a couple of days ago before, um, because she couldn't make it to today's panel. But I want to bring in our, our panellists now, Trevor Molke from the New Zealand Treasury Department, as well as Ruben Berg from the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. He's a, a member of, of that group. Trevor, um, to you, to you first. What struck you out of uh, that uh, that conversation between Lil uh, and myself when it comes to the subject of of this panel, treaty obligations and accountabilities? Uh, so I thought um, I thought that Lil uh, enunciated the situation really, really well. The context of building towards mutual trust, a conversation and a process that enables rather than disables that and being able to stick to the long haul uh, to find the results. Uh, I think that um, what that means for uh, some of the tribes uh, is that equally uh, taking an episodic approach over a longer haul uh, has meant some frustrations, but equally has meant that the uh, finality uh, perhaps has uh, uh, been more worthwhile than at first imagined uh, within the context of treaty settlements. Uh, but uh, uh, so I'll stop there. But j just uh, at the beginning of the conference today, uh, we made acknowledgement to uh, sorry business. We made acknowledgement to uh, some of the um, participants not being able to arrive into these panels. Uh, so just for the conference sake is uh, our man Taku Parai, uh, who leads a tribe here uh, nearby the Wellington uh, metropolis, has also asked uh, that I make some comments on his behalf throughout the afternoon. Uh, so I'm glad to do that in that context, Dan, uh, but equally uh, to back up the judge's acknowledgement, uh, as is customary, tēnā koutou e te whenua, Tēnā koutou e ngā ma, tini mate, uh, tēnā tātou katoa. Greetings, everybody. Trevor, did you want to make those comments on behalf of the tribe now, or should I come back to you at the end of the panel to make those, do you think? I think let's loop back and, uh, you know, let the impact of Lil, Lil's uh, uh, comments uh, and uh, come back to me okay. towards the end. Thanks. Thank you. Let's bring in Ruben now. Ruben's a proud Gunditjmara man from Melbourne, Victoria, and is a member of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria, of Victoria, the Assembly, of course, being the voice for Aboriginal communities in the Victorian treaty process, and, and Victoria at the forefront uh, in terms of Australian jurisdictions, in terms of progressing treaty discussions, as well as being a member of the First Peoples Assembly of uh, Victoria. Rubens also a commissioner with the Victorian Environmental Water Holder, a member of the Heritage Council of Victoria and a director of Western Port Water. Welcome, Ruben. Before we get into your work with uh, in the Victorian context, uh, what I've found fascinating over the conference so far is just hearing the approaches and vastly different state of affairs in New Zealand in terms of the Crown and its relationship with First Peoples. What struck you out of uh, my chat with Lil? Yeah, I mean, I think it is really interesting um, to be able to have those comparisons between what's happening in Australia and New Zealand and also for us as the Assembly, what's happening in other parts of the world as well because there's similar treaty conversations happening around the world. And what always strikes me when I listen to those sorts of conversations and, and comparisons is that there are many, many things that are very similar and there are many, many things that are different. Um, and so it's, been, it's really interesting as part of this treaty process in Victoria to see what we can draw from what's happened in other places and what we need to come up with ourselves um, here. But, you know, the need to have an understanding of where does self-determination sit for Aboriginal people within their own business, their own lands, their own waters, but also where does the Aboriginal voice sit within the broader context of society? How can we have a voice in those things where we don't necessarily have authority over? Um, I think that was interesting spelled out and, and separated within what Lou was talking about too. 
um, in the in your sort of thinking and the group's thinking in this space? Have you looked to New Zealand um, to to see how a treaty negotiation and a treaty negotiation process, given it is such a process we're talking about here, um, how yeah how that should unfold in Victoria? Yes, we, we've had um, we've had members of our uh, assembly travel around to different places, including to New Zealand, to talk to people and hear what their experiences were. And we've, with the wonderful technology we can use these days, we've had conversations uh, globally with people from around the world as well. Um, and I think we haven't quite yet got enough down into the, the nitty gritty detail. Like I think it's one thing to kind of have a surface understanding. But I think the next phase in our process, we will really need to delve down into what was the actual detail, what was the the actual fine wording that made a difference in in some of these places, and how can we be mindful of those same things, and both learning the positives, the things that worked, and and maybe what could have been improved, so that we can, you know, have the best foundation here in Victoria. Lil talked about truth telling um, and how important that has been in the New Zealand context in terms of building relationships uh, between the Crown and Maori. Uh, I understand that your group, the First Peoples Assembly in Victoria, is also breaking ground in this area. Where's where's that up to? Yeah, so it was a really important first step for us as an assembly to ensure that there was going to be some form of truth-telling process to actually have government and the broader society here in Victoria really understand what did happen in the past, to give our people the opportunity to be heard on those things so that you can have a solid foundation for moving forward into a treaty along many of the similar lines that Lil was mentioning before. And so we put this idea out there that we wanted to have a process. And as we've seen so far within this process, from my perspective, the government was very receptive of that. And they're on board. They're working with us at the moment to kind of fine tune the details of what this uh, truth telling process will look like. But I'm, I'm quite confident that we're going to have a really robust process that will really get to the, the heart of things and hopefully actually lead to some actual outcomes that come from that. It's, it's one thing to get the truth aired and out there. It's another thing to say, well, what do we actually do with that? How do we move forward from that? And I think that's the other really important next step that, that we've got to focus on as the Assembly. Yeah, what are your thoughts around that, how you springboard off the, the truth-telling to, to then to the next steps in terms of the treaty building? Well, that's one of the things we're hoping comes directly from the body that does the truth telling. We've, we've um, asked, hoped that they're going to give us some direct um, ideas about how to do that. Um, and so I don't want, necessarily want to preempt too much about what it could look like. But I think when we, you know, if I look just, for example, in the area of the justice system and some of the horrific things that we've got happening and have happened historically within the justice system and incarceration rates for Indigenous peoples, I think there are some clear learnings we'll be able to get about what was done wrong in the past to give us a really good steer and direction so that when we have uh, statewide agreements, that can address those things. And when we have local agreements, there can all be some, also be some way of addressing those um, issues as well. Back to you, just still on this point around, around truth-telling, just given how um, important Lil certainly thinks it's been in this, in this process. I suppose, yeah, can you tell us in the New Zealand context what sort of um, what laid the, the groundwork to allow a process of truth telling to take place? Because uh, in the Australian context, certainly, there's often an avoidance or a shying away from harsh truths about our history or a, a tendency to characterise um, a, a more accurate telling of, of, of Australia's history as history wars. Did you have that in New Zealand? And if so, how did you overcome it to allow truth telling to take place? I think you have to be certain uh... Uh, in entering these processes that uh, from a Maori base uh, that the arrangements would inspire pono, that they come from a truthful uh, orientation, uh, that they are tika, T-I-K-A, tika, uh, that they are the right thing to do, uh, that uh, these processes uh, and challenges uh, are compassionate, they're full of aroha, uh, for the people who enter into these uh, truth-telling sessions and into this journey. Uh, and they are compassionate also for the people on whose behalf you're trying to resolve these things. So these are never easy conversations. And I think Lil's 
a video at the beginning of this panel session covered some of that. It's like a partnership where you actually have to work out, uh, you know, whether you really want to uh, work with one another or or pause for now until uh, time has gone on and different people or different arrangements can be worked through. The main thing, though, is the intent is to find a reconciliative space and then to build uh, for uh, a solution from then in, if that makes sense. And I think uh, coming back to my my uh, Māori thinking, if you like, uh, if it's pono, it comes from a truthful space. If it's tika, the right thing to do. Uh, and if it is aroha, compassionate in the long run, uh, then the, the journey or the direction of travel, though challenging and sometimes arduous, and sometimes with troughs and valleys and peaks, uh, uh, you can get there. And uh, certainly the work that's been accomplished uh, prior to the Arafiti uh, and uh, now with the Arafiti in play, uh, we can be hopeful of uh, more work of that kind, I think. Just on, on settlements, because um, you're a great fill-in, but you are filling in in today's session for um, the, the Nate Tall group who we were hoping to speak to, and they had a settlement in 2014 uh, to the value of uh, 70 million uh, New Zealand dollars. Well, what do you think uh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of the settlements, what uh, what's best practice when it comes to reaching a settlement and then what that settlement looks like for, for Maori groups? Yeah, those are good questions. And uh, if I can just, um, as a precursor, is that across the responsibility of tribes uh, is also uh, the connection through genealogy and descent lines. And so it's not as if I'm speaking uh, on behalf of Taku, who is totally foreign to me, uh, if you look at the descent lines, uh, there are tribal connections uh, together. So it's in that space uh, that I make some of these comments. Uh, so there was a uh, uh, an arduous journey to reach the 2014, uh, and it does it does have a number or a quantum on there. Uh, and and uh, Lil again alluded to it that there's the pre-settlement, the settlement arrangements and then the post-settlement arrangements. And I have to say in the last um, half a decade, Ngāti Toa Rangatira uh, here in the uh, Greater Wellington metropolis area, uh, they would have gone north of that number, but increasingly are applying a very, not only smart business, but also smart community building, smart service uh, arrangements to the populations uh, in uh, the Greater Wellington area so that they're building uh, their responsibility. Because when you have tribal responsibility, you also have responsibility for the people who are in your precinct. And so in Ngāti Tuarangatira's case, health services, housing services, commercial fishing services, those are all of the combinations that have been enabled uh, as a result of the journey. Ruben, to you, um, I, I know this is leaping a few um, steps ahead, of course, in the Australian context, but do, do you think that settlements of the type that we see in New Zealand that Lil spoke um, about there, where there is a, a land component, a financial component, and also a, an apology or truth-telling component, do you think that um, Australia is ready for those type of, of settlements? Um, are they ready for them? I think it's that is what we're striving for. That sort of arrangement is what we're, we're we're striving for, and I think there's different levels of readiness across the nation. Obviously, I'm talking here because we in Victoria are a part of a treaty process, but there is there's not a national conversation around treaty that the government is having. There's a national conversation that we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are having, but it's not one that the Commonwealth government seems to be wanting to have at the moment. So. Um, there is different levels of readiness to have these conversations. Um, but I think broadly here in Victoria, there is uh, a fairly good amount of openness and willingness and, and wanting to have 
this resolved uh, in, in terms of having an actual formal agreement, having a treaty process. Um, not that that draws a line in the sand that things are now finished, but a, a new way of doing business with us as Victorian Aboriginal peoples. I think yeah. that's something that all, all Victorians, I think, have an interest in. And, you know, to me, that's always been one of the drivers around this whole treaty process, that it does need to have that broad scale benefit. I think it needs to benefit traditional owners in Victoria. It needs to benefit Victorian Aboriginal people more broadly who may not be traditional owners, but also needs to benefit all Victorians. Uh, and so I think if we can keep having that conversation like that, that will get that support from everybody because we need to have that holistic support so that the government can continue to uh, take up these strong reforms. Trevor, we've got around about five minutes left so I'll, I'll for this panel discussion. So I'll come to you now just to, to relay the message that uh, that uh, you've been given to, uh, to to bring to us today. I think that uh, the message from Taku Parai, uh, the current chair of Ngati Tua Rangatira, part of, con part of a confederation of tribes uh, that holds mana whenua here in the greater, greater Wellington region. Uh, he would bring, want to bring his best wishes uh, to the Anzog. Uh, he is open to the option of later filming him and loading that up to have his comments directly. Uh, he is uh, he is mourning the loss of his sister. And so the tribe itself uh, running the ceremonies uh, locally in Porirua. Uh, if you want to check out the maps of where everything is in Wellington, uh, he would be relaying that uh, uh, ultimately the benefits accrue uh, to uh, the mokopuna, the grandchildren, uh, mokopuna, uh, and the work uh, in these lifetimes uh, is to uh, perhaps uh, resolve these things so that uh, there are more enabling legacies uh, ahead of us. The last thing that um, uh, Taku conveyed with me earlier today is our best wishes uh, to those across the Tasman uh, in your efforts uh, in a reconciliation of the conversations you're having. And one of the things I would add to his best wishes, Ruben, to you and the, uh, uh, the First Nations Aboriginal people in Australia is that sometimes, even without a treaty, uh, our common interests uh, and our nation's actual needs uh, could be the drivers for uh, respectful conversations uh, that we're finding our way into here as well. So with that in mind, Dan, those are, those are some of the things. Uh, we've been mindful that uh, in the reconciliation process, uh, in this post-settlement uh, matters, that we are uh, doing good things. Uh, and we want to do more things to serve the community who are within our tribal area. And so that's not just the tribal members, uh, that's the entire community uh, here in the Greater Wellington area. I'll stop there, Dan. That's pretty much uh, all I'm licensed to say today. <laughs> oh, one last thing, Dan. People may or may not know that when the All Blacks rugby team takes the field, they begin with a. Uh, acknowledgement of the culture of this land with a thing called the haka uh, and that haka uh, the one which starts kamate kamate kaura kaura uh, it frightens many people but I know you Aussies are not frightened by it uh, but that haka originally uh, came from Ngati Toa Rangatira uh, from the ancestral lines uh, to that tribe and I'd want to pass that good wish on. Is their life, is their life, is their death, is their death uh, persist? And uh, it's amazing what we can get done. <laughs> Trevor, thank you. And Ruben, thank you. It's been great to hear from, from both of you and, and Ruben on the progress that's been made in, in Victoria. So all the best with that work.